The seven science instruments on board New Horizons are ingeniously designed. They're small and weigh very little. On average, each uses no more power than a household nightlight, and they're intended to work together seamlessly. We picked names for most of our instruments. We have Rex and Alice and Ralph, and uh, it's just a happy family. The black and white telephoto camera called Lori will be used for navigation in the months before closest approach and to study Pluto's surface. This big barrel is a telescope called LORI, the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager. It's our biggest, most powerful camera in terms of resolution power. The cameras are key. For over 60 years, Pluto remained little more than a dot, as small and dim as a walnut seen from 30 miles away. In the 1990s, even the Hubble Space Telescope showed just a blurry surface. And this true color image is the best we can do with Hubble and advanced computers. Pluto clearly has a varied surface, but whether these are mountains or craters or polar caps remains a mystery. At this resolution, there's no more information. Here's what a more familiar planet would look like if all we had were similar images all the richness of Earth's surface and atmosphere would be missing. That's where New Horizons wide-angle camera comes in. We want to get up close and personal. Ralph is our main uh, color camera. It's also the, ca the camera that's going to take our main global maps of Pluto. We can get in and map at scales of, of kilometers and sub-kilometers and even down to tens of meters. Football field-sized uh, resolution at Pluto, we're going to be able to, you know, to see things thousands of times more precisely than what we've been able to do with the Hubble Space Telescope. The science team wants to know not just what Pluto looks like, but also what it's made of. That's where another part of the wide-angle camera, the LISA infrared detector, comes in. At the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, science team member Will Grundy explains how LISA works. In my backpack, is a field spec pro which is a field portable spectrometer from analytical spectral devices it's very similar in capabilities to the lisa instrument on board the new horizon spacecraft in that it's able to see out to 2.5 microns infrared spectroscopy is one of the most powerful techniques that we can use to tell about the compositions of remote surfaces sunlight comes in illuminates the surface bounces off into the spectrometer and some wavelengths don't make it back some wavelengths do depending on the chemical composition on Earth, we only really have one kind of precipitation. We have water, and sometimes it comes down as rain, and sometimes it comes down as snow. On Pluto, it's thought that exotic ices, like methane, nitrogen, and carbon monoxide, condensed out of the atmosphere as solids, never as liquids. That's not surprising. Pluto's temperature is believed to be minus 228 centigrade, just 35 degrees above absolute zero. To the human eye, Lots of different ices look pretty similar. They all look white, pretty much. Uh, we have here carbon dioxide ice, and snow, of course, and also paraffin wax, which is an organic compound, which is pretty similar to the methane ice on Pluto. And they look all white to the eye, but to the infrared spectrometer, take a look at how different they look. Carbon dioxide. and water ice. And all three of these substances look pretty similar to the human eye. They all look white, but in the near infrared, they're very different from each other because they have different molecular structures and they have different vibrational modes, and so they absorb different wavelengths of infrared light. Strangely enough, Pluto's surface seems to have about the same brightness as freshly fallen snow on Earth. It appears so dim only because it's so small and very far away. Equally bizarre, Pluto sometimes seems to behave more like a comet than a planet. When its eccentric orbit brings it closer to the sun, its surface heats up and produces a denser atmosphere. Ralph's sister instrument, using a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum, will be studying that. This is the ALICE ultraviolet spectrometer, which will probe the composition of Pluto's atmosphere and also study its surface. It measures light with a shorter wavelength than what you and I see. We fly past Pluto. That's the antenna direction. We're going to turn so the antenna is pointed back at Pluto. 
back toward the sun and we're going to watch as the sun passes behind Pluto and we're going to see the sunlight get absorbed at these ultraviolet wavelengths and we can tell what the atmosphere is made out of at these different heights. Studying starlight as a planet eclipses or passes in front of it is just the same technique used to discover Pluto's atmosphere in the first place. If a world with an atmosphere passes in front of a star, the light will dim gradually rather than suddenly blinking out. Scientists call this occultation, and in 1988, a team that included New Horizons' Leslie Young flew an experiment aboard NASA's Kuiper Airborne Observatory to try to find out if Pluto had an atmosphere. Using an airplane guaranteed clear skies high above Earth's clouds and the ability to follow the path of the Pluto eclipse out over the ocean, this in-flight audio yes. records the actual moment of discovery. The star's light faded gradually, then slowly returned, the first proof that distant Pluto had an atmosphere. As Pluto approaches and retreats from the sun, it's thought that there are seasons and weather that resurfaces the planet with fresh, bright ices. Some researchers think this is what creates the light and dark regions, but as yet, no one knows. New Horizons hopes to get to Pluto before winter sets in, and the atmosphere freezes back down to the surface as solid ice. REX, a radio experiment using the spacecraft's high-gain antenna, will also track how signals to and from Earth vary as they pass close to Pluto and Charon, measuring temperature and atmospheric composition. Two more instruments will study how the solar wind, the constant stream of subatomic particles and energy flowing out from the sun, interact with Pluto. SWAP, the name means solar wind at Pluto, and Pepsi, are so powerful, they'll be able to sense Pluto from great distances. We can smell, if you will, Pluto from a million kilometers away with Pepsi. And we can detect the extent of its atmosphere by feel with SWAP, possibly from as far as 100,000 kilometers away, but certainly as we get into tens of thousands of kilometers. Last of the seven instruments, but the first completed, is the student dust counter. Every part, from logo to detectors, was designed entirely by college students while meeting rigorous NASA specifications. Until I was on this project, I had no idea that people would even want to measure planetary dust for any sort of reason. The students also documented their project in behind-the-scenes home videos. Now I know that not only is it there, but it's an important part of looking for planets. Its job is to profile the density of dust particles all the way across the solar system for the first time. But the real breakthrough of this instrument is the first time that uh, students have been able to build a flight quality instrument on their own and fly it on a mission to a planet. Till now, no dust counter has gotten data farther out than 18 times the distance of Earth from the sun. Design specs from the SDC are twice that and more, lasting decades traveling billions of miles, surviving temperatures near absolute zero. Going out into space towards Pluto, we're going to be seeing very cold temperatures. And it's hard to design an instrument that all the materials can withstand these cold temperatures. So to test and make sure that this is possible, we're going to hover a dust detector right above the surface of some liquid nitrogen. If we hover it right above, we can um, reach about negative 120 degrees Celsius, which is a temperature we want to test to and see if any of our materials um, start to crack or tear or break at these temperatures. So what's the big deal about dust? We have dust everywhere. Dust in your house, dust outside, dust all out the solar system. Well, dust comes from the grinding up of material that gets shed and left around. In the case of the solar system, we believe that the dust that's flying around the solar system was produced by the grinding up of asteroids, the grinding up of Kuiper Belt objects, the grinding up of ring particles and so on that is left over from the process of not just forming the solar system, but its constant evolution over time. The students also faced review boards of veteran scientists and engineers 
The SDC wouldn't fly if it didn't serve the science objectives and have every chance of working. We then decided to go to a little bit bigger of a detector to increase our surface area. Our final instrument will have 12 of these dust detectors all lined up on a panel about 0.1 meters squared. It's great experience because it's not only sitting in front of a computer analyzing data, but you are actually designing an instrument that's going to fly into space. And it's a real thing. And it's also going to Pluto, which is why many of our students are so psyched about the project. Together, the seven science instruments are the most powerful set of detectors ever sent on a first flyby of any world in our solar system. But making sure the close encounter is successful relies as much on humans here on Earth as on hardware far away in space.